Would you turn with me to the 15th chapter of Luke, Luke's Gospel, 15th chapter. I'd like to read from verse 11 down. Luke 15, from 11 to 32. And he said, that is, Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fat calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants, and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf, because he has received him back safe and son. But he became angry, and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young boat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf for him. He said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. So this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Heavenly Father, touch us through your spirit so that the words of your son may come alive to us this morning and that we may know what to do with it, Master, so that it can transform our own lives. For we pray this in His name. Amen. This is a fairly well-known passage of scripture, isn't it? If you've been in church for any length of time or in Sunday school, you remember this uh, story uh, for it has been used and talked about very often. But uh, this morning, I have just a few things that I'd like to kind of mine from the story and present to you because I think it has uh, import for us as uh, sons and daughters of God. The story centers around the prodigal son who asks his father for his inheritance and then goes away and spends it all. And when it all ends, then it so happens that there's a famine in the country and he has no money to buy food. 
or to take care of himself, and so he goes out and he gets a job. And the only job that he gets is to look after pigs. And the Bible says that he would have readily eaten the food that the pigs were being given, but even that was not being given to him. It was in that state of desperation that he found himself. That he was ready to eat the food given to pigs, but couldn't have it. And in that moment, when he had reached the very bottom, this realization struck him that the servants in his father's house had things to eat. And here he was, a servant, with nothing to eat. And even when that thought came to him, he says to himself, I will arise and go back to my father. I will arise. It was an act of his will, of his volition. Because it was his will that took him away from his father's house. It was the things of the flesh, the allurements that he thought he would indulge in, the freedom that he thought he would experience that made him leave the comfort and the security, the stability of the father's home. And then out in this far country, far away from that security, he recognizes that even the lowest in that hierarchy in his father's home had more to eat, better things to eat than him. And so his will kicks in again and he says, I will arise and go to my father. And as I read this, I realized that sometimes there are many who fall into this very category. There are many who leave the Father and wander away thinking that their will is better than the will of the Father. That somehow the Father is shortchanging them, that they've got to look out for themselves. So they go off. And maybe there are some of you sitting here who will be able to say, you know, that's me. I wandered away from him. And maybe you've not kind of gone off and spent your time just with prostitutes or other things, doing stuff like that. Maybe it's just that you've wandered away from God in your mind. That it's been a long time since you had a conversation with him. It's been a while since you read the word of God. And you know that it's been a long time since you were in the position that you needed or need to be in. And beloved, for those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, the place where you find yourself in right now, I can guarantee you is a place of barrenness. It's a place where there is no fruit. It's a place where there is no joy. It's a place where you are hungry and thirsting. And maybe you don't know what to do in that place. Maybe you are wishing that you could go back. Wishing that you never left. And the good news for us is the next part of this, this chapter talks about how ready God is to receive. For the Bible says that the father was actually waiting, looking out for him. That when he was far away, his father spotted him. And instead of waiting for him to come, he ran to him to embrace him and bring him home. And all that it took was for the son to reach that point where he says, I will arise 
and go to my father. I wonder whether there are some of you seated here who are saying that's precisely what I need to do. I'm in a faraway place. Maybe you're just busy doing everything that you think you ought to be doing, but the connection with him is not there anymore. Or maybe Satan has come by and whispered to you and said, you're done. You walked away from him and you're in this, caught up in this sin and there is no way back to him. And yet, beloved, the good news is that in, in our faith we are allowed new turns. We are allowed to turn around and come back. And the only criteria for that is if we realize that we have done wrong. If we confess our sins, then He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins. But that's all that it takes today. Is to be able to confess and say, Lord, I took a wrong turn. I let my will <coughs> override yours. And I'm out in this far country. The raft of joy and peace and all those things that are just so wonderful that I remember, but I don't have. Maybe this morning you need to say, I will arise and go. And go back. And look what the Father does. He, he welcomes and the Son is ready to the spiel, isn't it? I will say to him, they're treating as one of your hired servants, I've sinned against you, and all of those things that it's like the father is just saying, hush, I'm not even listening to you. Get the robe, get the ring, get the sandals. For this my son was dead, is alive, is lost and is now found. That's all that matters. He's come home. He's come home. And see, Jesus was talking very particularly to the scribes and Pharisees, wasn't it? When you look at the beginning of this chapter, places the context. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. But the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Because they had a problem with the way that he was embracing sinners. And Jesus was making this point that the angels rejoice in heaven. In verse 10, in the same way I tell you there is joy in the presence of, presence of the angels of God. O oh, one sinner who repents. Verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Heaven rejoices when somebody comes home. Father is saying, you're not a slave. You're not a servant. You're my son. Put the ring back on his finger. Put the robe on his shoulders. Put sandals on his feet. For this my son was lost, but is now found. He's come home. We've got to rejoice. We've got to celebrate. Beloved, that is what awaits you when you come home. Wherever you are, there's rejoicing that accomplishes a new turn. When you come back, I want to kind of pivot off the same point, bring the sub point of this. The prodigal son knew that the home was a place that he could turn and come back to. And I want to ask you as parents, or even as grandparents, as some of us are there. Do your children know the way home? Do your children know the way home? When they eat, when they get to a place where there is no more hope, do they know enough of the world to know that they can come home and that they will be welcome? 
many times I've, I've said this story of when we were he was as pastoring a church there. We had a man who came to the church and he'd been an alcoholic for over 25 years. And some of you remember the story. He went off the road one day and landed up in hospital and realized that he had to get his life back together. He came to church. He was just so hungry for the word. He grew and grew and he actually became our Sunday school superintendent. But for the 25 years that he was off, his son grew up. And his son was arrested for almost every juvenile crime that he would be arrested for. It was completely wayward. And he would cry and sob he would talk to us about his son and he said, I knew how to come back home, but my son doesn't. I knew. My parents made sure that I went to Sunday school and I learned the Bible. And so I knew how to come back. My son doesn't. And so beloved. I ask you, are you doing enough to make sure that your children know the way home? I've been doing confirmation classes for 21 years now. I tell you, some of the saddest moments that I have in my classes, amidst the enormous joy that I have in conducting the classes and doing them myself, because I enjoy it so much. The saddest moments are when I ask one of them to turn to a particular book of the Bible that they don't know whether to look in the Old Testament or the New Testament. They don't. It's not that they are not taught that in Sunday school. They are. I recognize immediately that they are ones who come irregularly to church and don't really bother whether their children are in Sunday school or not. I think it's so sad when that's the message that is passed on by parents to children that's really not important. I've spoken to so many, and many of you here during exam times when you try and take them out of church so they can study a little more, go for a class, and I tell you, don't do that. Don't do that, because you're looking at it circumstantially, but in principle, it's a terrible principle to pass on to your children, because what you are telling them is this, that when it gets difficult in life, the first thing to take out of your life is God. That's the principles that you pass on to the children. That when it gets difficult in life, Take God out of the equation and try and handle it by yourself. But he's the only one who can take that situation and make it come become better. But you've passed on a wrong principle. We have a responsibility. When we have children who are dedicated here, we ask them. Will you so model the Christian faith that when your child reaches the age when he or she will decide that they will have no other recourse but to say, of course, I want to be a child of God. Can they say that? Will you so model the kingdom, scriptures, prayer, will you so model it for them that that is the only answer that they will have when they one day have to decide for themselves? That's what a Christian home should look like. I ask you, with just See, all seriousness, do your children know the way home? If they ever get lost as they grow up, do they know the way home? Let me have the elder brother. 
seems like till now the Pharisees must have been okay. Jesus is explaining about the sinners, for once he's leaving us out of the picture. But Jesus did. Because now he begins to paint a picture of the Pharisees through the eyes of the older brother. Because this brother, when he came close, he heard the music, he stops, he doesn't go in to find out, he calls one of the servants and says, what's going on? Servant tells him, yes, your brother's back. Father has got the fatted calf, he's cut it and celebrating. And he gets angry. And the father comes out and pleads with him and says, son, come in. Your brother was dead, now he's alive, he's lost, he's found, we've got to celebrate. He says, I've stayed with you, I've been obedient to you. You've never given me so much as a, a, a party. Come on, come And this, your son, not even my brother, this your son. He was off prostituting and that that's not in the script. He puts it in there. And he refuses to come. And that's where the Pharisees were. Because for them, holiness had to do with behavior. It had nothing to do with the way they were thinking. If they did what was right and what was visible to people, then they were okay. And yet Jesus changed that equation, didn't he? In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have been told that you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, even if you think with lust about a woman, you have already committed adultery. And yet their thoughts were so against anybody coming to God. That's a possibly a place that we took and then we are not careful. Do not like the fact that God can forgive someone who's done something wrong. And we hold that grudge for God, although God has forgotten about it. God is forgiven. We still hold it. It was the father's problem. This is exactly how Jonah thought. Isn't it? Because when you look back at Jonah, God said, says, go to Nineveh. Because there's a tremendous amount of sin in that place. I want to bring judgment upon them. And Jonah heads off into Tarshish. And then God brings him finally to Nineveh and then he goes and preaches. And then the, the people repent. And then God relents. And in chapter 4 of Jonah, we see the reason. Jonah explicitly states, this is why I did what I did. Because I knew that you are a God who is gracious and slow to anger. And that you will relent and forgive. And I am the one who will stand here and say, God is going to do this, this and then you forgive. That's why I went to Tarshish. I couldn't handle the fact that you're a loving, gracious God and that you might forgive them. How often we look at that picture of Jonah and think, my goodness, how could he even think like that when if we were to look in a mirror, we probably would see the face of Jonah. But we have this judgmental, legalistic, <coughs> attitude that the other brother had. Unforgiving. Rigid. Celebration? No way. I wonder whether some of us need to repent to that attitude as well. They know that I have not rejoiced. The people who have done wrong have come. Into your kingdom, I will come back. I wanted you to bring judgment upon me.
this morning, you need to be able to have a picture of God in your mind's eye. For if you're like the prodigal son, then in your mind's eye, you need to see the arms of the Father outstretching to you, waiting to embrace you. Waiting to embrace you. And all it takes is a pivot in your mind that says, I will arise and go. I will return. Repentance, not remorse. Remorse is sadness for what you've done, but you stay there feeling sad. Repentance is turning around and coming back and saying, I will not go back to that place. Or maybe this morning it's the eldest son that has just snuck up on you and said, we're very much alike this morning. Maybe you too need to see the Father pleading with you and saying, let's have a good It's a good thing. It's a good thing that people who have done wrong, recognize they have done wrong, and come back and ask for forgiveness. It's a good thing. Let's celebrate it. Because that's how the kingdom works. The angels in heaven rejoice when something like this happens. Why don't you do it as well? So we have it between the younger son and the elder. Which are the overarching love of the father. As he calls out to you and says, come back home. But he has come to change your thinking, your attitude, your mindset, and all the things that you are tired of. Lord Supper is a good place to come, isn't it? And to deal with those things. <coughs> One thing that I want to <coughs> underscore as we come, sometimes we think that our, our relationship with God is broken, that when we sin or we go our way and do our own will, that we are no longer children of God. And the truth is, beloved, that if you are part of the kingdom of God, if you accept Jesus as Savior, then we are sons and daughters of God. And what breaks when we tend to sin is the fellowship with God. It is not the relationship that we have as sons and daughters of God. Because that's where Satan tries to drive the wedge and he says, now you are fatherless. There's no place else to go because that relationship is cut and smart. It's the fellowship that has gone. It's just like a family at home. You have children or your parents, you have a disagreement and you don't talk to each other maybe or you talk too much to each other and either way there's a lot of disagreement in the home. The relationship still is there between father and son, father, mother and daughter, between parent and child. It's still there. It's the fellowship that is not happening. But that's the fellowship is what draws us closer and closer and closer to God. Once we are sons and daughters of God, it's the fellowship that helps us to understand the mind of God and to walk in the path that God has. Satan would like you to believe that you are no longer a son or a daughter of God. But if that were true, then 1 John 1 9 won't be in the Bible. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is not a license to sin. It is the reality that God knew that we will make mistakes and put a way back for us. Maybe this morning. It's a long time since you had any fellowship with God. It's a long time since you hung out with Him, chatted with Him. It's a long time since you asked Him, God, what is your will for me? What is your purpose for my life? It's been a long time since you had a conversation with Him. And maybe today that fellowship, that beautiful fellowship that God had with Adam and Eve in the garden, where we walked and talked to him. Maybe that needs to be restored. Maybe it's 
not in so long. It's not like maybe today is the day to rectify that. To restore fellowship. To come back from home. Or to renew and have a new mindset. What comes is love and grace. Thank you. 